passage of scripture out of John, the sun blasted through this cross up here. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed it, but all of a sudden it seemed to hit me more than usual. I don't know. Many people wonder how did a religion based on a claim that its founder was executed by the ruling government of his time and then rose from the dead. People wonder, how did, how did this survive through the centuries? How could it have so many followers? How could this religion have so much influence, or this man, Jesus, have so much influence over human history and Western civilization? You know, several years ago, I read a book by John Ortberg called uh, Who Is This Man? And the entire book documents how throughout history, the impact of the life of Jesus has influenced so much of our world with education and hospitals, uh, ethics, moral codes. The influence of Jesus has had a powerful impact. His ministry only lasted three years on earth. Nations, empires have risen, they've fallen. But he only ministered for three years and his influence is still felt today. Jesus had great success during his years of ministry. But we know that he was eventually betrayed by one of his own disciples. He was rejected and condemned by his own religion and their, the leaders of that religion during that time. He was put to death like a criminal on a cross by the Roman army. And by now you'd think that a man who had experienced such fate would have been forgotten throughout history. But for some reason, it never, he never has been forgotten. And today I want to take a look at why Jesus has never been forgotten through history. After Jesus was crucified on the cross, he was buried in the tomb of a friend. The Roman commander ordered that his tomb be sealed and guarded for three days. And with a platoon of Roman sentries guarding the uh, tomb of Jesus, it was unlikely that it, anything could be faked. Uh, when you're on sentry duty in the military, they take that very seriously. I remember many years ago, I had my young da my daughter, she was like, I don't know, maybe three or four years old, we, we were in Washington, D.C., and we went to see the tomb of the unknown soldier at Arlington Cemetery. And I don't know how many of you have been there, but it's a very serious uh, sentry duty, the guarding the tomb. It's an honor. And I remember my daughter, she was kind of wild, and somehow she got loose. And when that little girl got loose, she ran right straight for that guard in front of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And this guy was, I mean, he didn't stop and say, oh, little girl. <laughs> He's, he goes like this with his rifle. Hold! <laughs> you are not permitted to cross this line. <laughs> and my daughter, like, jolted and started crying. It's like, I mean, this guy was scary. Needless to say, in the military, when you're on sentry duty, it's serious business. And you can just absolutely bank on the fact that those Roman sentries took their job very seriously. On the third day, early in the morning, a woman named Mary Magdalene came to visit Jesus' grave. And to her surprise and dismay and shock, she noticed that the sealed tomb the big stone that had been rolled in front of the opening that had been sealed had been rolled away. And when she saw that, she was alarmed, and so she went, ran back to the disciples of Jesus and reported to them that somebody had opened the tomb of Jesus and someone had removed his body. And if you read the passage, you'll notice that there is really no thought of a resurrection. The two disciples that she reported this to, one was named Peter and the other one was named John, the writer of this particular gospel. The scripture says that they immediately ran to the tomb to check out what had really happened. And when they got there, they saw that the tomb was empty and only things in the tomb were his burial cloth. It was all neatly folded 
and laying on the spot where Jesus had been laying. Now, one of the disciples, the, 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 actually the guy who, who authored this uh, gospel, John, he knew what had happened because Jesus had told his disciples that he would die, be crucified, that he would r- r- raise on the third day. And John wants to document that he knew immediately what had happened, that Jesus had risen from the grave. But if you read the the passage, you'll notice that Peter and Mary, the woman who found the stone rolled away, both of them thought that someone had broken into the tomb and stole Jesus' body. So Mary spent the rest of the morning standing by Jesus' empty tomb, crying because she thought that his body had been removed. Somebody had taken it. She didn't know who took it. She didn't know why it had been taken. But as she's standing there, weeping and wondering what's happened to Jesus, she hears a voice. And the voice says, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? And Mary responds to the voice. She says, I'm looking for Jesus. And I don't know where they've taken him. Notice, most of the morning she still doesn't know, doesn't realize that Jesus has risen from the grave. She still thinks somebody has taken his body. She, the voice she hears, she thinks it's the gardener, the, uh, the lawn guy who takes care of the cemetery. And she, re- she replies to the one speaking to her. She says, uh, do you know where he is? <laughs> do you know where they have taken his body when they removed him from the tomb? And then she turns around And she discovers that the person she's talking to, the voice that she heard, was Jesus himself. And then all of a sudden the scripture tells us, now she believes. And why does she believe? Because she saw Jesus in person. Then the scripture goes on to tell us that later, that same evening, ten of Jesus' disciples who were hiding out behind locked doors, laying low, All of a sudden, Jesus appears to them. He doesn't come back as a ghost. He's not, you know, one of those uh, things you see on TV. He's not a disembodied spirit. But Jesus appears to them in the flesh. He's alive. They talk to him. They see him. They, They see the nail scars in his hand. And they knew it was Jesus. And they realize that he was alive now they believe that Jesus has risen from the dead so you can see here that seeing is believing here in the gospels these these disciples Mary they have tangible material rational evidence confirmed in their mind that Jesus is alive they've seen him they've touched him they've talked to him But then it goes on to say that there was one of the disciples that wasn't in town, wasn't in the house that day. His name was Thomas. He'd been gone for about a week. And when he rejoined the other disciples, and he came back, they were all excited. And they tell Thomas, who had been absent that that day, they they say, hey, you're not going to believe this. We just saw Jesus. He dropped in to visit us. And we talked to him. And they tell Thomas, you should have been here, man. Do you know what Thomas' response was? Thomas looks at his other ten uh, companions or fellow disciples, colleagues, and he says, no way. You guys didn't see anything. I don't believe you. I, it doesn't say this in the original Greek, but I, th- I think he said, what have you guys been smoking? <laughs> <laughs> and then there, he utters the famous line that we all have heard many times. Thomas says, unless I see, notice he says, unless I see with my own eyes the marks of the nails in his hands and and I put my finger in the nail scars, Thomas says, until I see that, I will not believe. What Thomas is asking for is hard evidence. He has to see Jesus before he can believe. Jesus has to appear to him so that he can touch him and see him and confirm in his mind rationally that yes, Jesus is alive. He did raise from the dead. Thomas has been 
given the title of Doubting Thomas throughout history. But really, actually, he's really no different than everyone else, the rest of the disciples. They didn't believe it until they saw it. The only one that actually believed right on the spot, apparently, according to the gospel, is John. But, you know, we have to, we have to give Thomas here a break because he's like the rest of us. He was a rational human being in his world. Someone raising from the dead doesn't really happen in real life. I mean, I've never seen it happen. I've been to cemeteries many, many times throughout the years and decades that I've been a pastor. I've buried a lot of people. And I will tell you, I've never seen a grave open and I've never seen someone rise from the dead. You might say, well, you know what, though, Craig? Thomas had to have been there when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He had to have witnessed that, so he knows it's a possibility. But we have to realize in Thomas's mind that the guy who rose Lazarus from the dead is now the one who was dead, right? <laughs> you got to look at the logic that's going through Thomas's thought process. But then the scripture goes on to tell us that eventually Thomas gets the proof that he needs. He got the evidence that he demanded. Jesus personally appeared to Thomas. And Thomas saw with his own eyes the nail scars. He touched Jesus. And now what does Thomas say? I believe. Seeing is believing. I, Thomas was a believer in the resurrection of Jesus. You know, the resurrection, we are told, of Jesus, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it tells us that if Jesus had not risen from the dead, Christianity would just be another religion. Jesus would be just another wise teacher who set a good example to live by. You know, I read a story years ago about it in the 1930s. There was a, a man named uh, Nik Nikolai Bukharin. He was the editor of the official state-run newspaper of the Soviet Union called Pravda. And Bukharin was a, he was a hardcore communist, an atheist. And he was known as being one of the intellectual, ideological defenders of the doctrine of communism and, and its ideology. And, and he would love to go around and lecture on communist philosophy and how wonderful it was. One day in the 1930s, he traveled to, from Moscow to Kiev to give an address on the subject of atheism, one of his favorite topics to lecture on. Uh, real communism is an atheistic, godless philosophy. And as he gave his lecture, uh, he attacked Christianity, of course. He ridiculed the idea of a resurrected Jesus. And just how foolish that is. And anybody that believes that is a uh, mindless, gullible person. So and after, after an hour of dismantling and exposing what he viewed as the false claims of Christianity, he asked for questions. Well, as he asked for questions, the large crowd that had gathered to hear his lecture remained silent. And Buchanan thought that the reason they were so silent was because he had done such a masterful job at discrediting Christianity, destroying the Christian faith intellectually, and defending the idea of atheism. He thought he had done such a great job and given such a great lecture. But slowly, I guess out of fear, which was a risky thing to do, one man stood up in the crowd and as he looked around, he shouted the ancient creed of the Russian Orthodox Church. And that day, after that lecture, the man shouted, Christ has risen. And in one voice, all those who had attended the lecture responded with a thundering, he is indeed risen. Throughout the centuries, and in spite of pagan empires and atheistic political regimes and secularization, people still believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Now, I've read and heard people point out 
that you can't find evidence of the resurrection of Jesus in science. I've had people say, well, there is no archaeological findings to document the resurrection of Jesus. There's no museum that has some type of account or some type of evidence that Jesus has risen from the dead. You can discount the eyewitnesses written and recorded in the Gospels. But the only place you can find tangible evidence of the resurrection of Jesus is in the lives of those who follow him. In the lives of us being here today. If you look at the lives of Christians, people who have received Christ as their Savior by faith, you can see that they've been changed. You can see that they've been transformed. You can see that the power of God has healed and touched their lives. You know, one of the most important questions is, how do modern people, almost 2,000 years removed from this historical event, when 2,000 years ago his own disciples didn't believe until they actually saw him, how do we believe today 2,000 years later? Jesus told Thomas in John chapter 20, verse 29, he says, you believe because you have seen me. And then he goes on to say, blessed are those who believe who have not seen me. How do those who have not seen Jesus in person? I mean, I, the bodily Jesus has never appeared to me, and I don't, he probably have not appeared to most of us in here or any of us in here. How do those who have not seen Jesus in person believe in his resurrection? According to the Bible, the way that we become believers in the resurrection, and uh, the Bible gives us some, some indications. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, it tells us that Jesus comes knocking at our door. Now, basically what it means is he makes the initial approach. He comes and knocks on our door. And our, and our response is we have to open the door and let him into our lives. He comes to us. I can remember when I was a teenager, I was 17 years old. And the only reason I went to church, I'll be honest with you folks, I was 17 years old. My parents initially had to force me to go to church, but, but then I started going on my own. And it wasn't because I was hungry for God. <laughs> The only reason I even went to church on Sunday was because there was a pretty blonde that I liked. <laughs> <laughs> and so therefore, I was anxious to go to church because I got to sit with her every Sunday. So I got up one, I mean, I, I, I was playing high school football and I hurried home from football practice, changed my clothes, took a shower, changed my clothes, and rushed to church on a weekday evening at a revival service. Now, it wasn't because I was wanting to go there and get saved. <laughs> like I told you, she was going to be there. So I thought, okay, I'll rush there. You know how it is when you're 17 years old. You, you puppy love, whatever you want to call it. So I go to church. I think it was a Tuesday or Monday. I can't remember. It was early beginning of the week. I had absolutely no, no little thought, if any, of giving my heart to Jesus, okay? <laughs> so I went to church that evening and I listened to the preacher preach. I had not got up that morning anticipating any spiritual awakening. I had not planned on giving my heart to Christ. Got up, went to school that day. Went to a revival service. Sat with my girlfriend, cannot remember what the sermon was. I remember who the preacher was, but I can't remember the, t the topic that he preached on. The only thing I can remember, it was during the invitation that the evangelist gave. I was drawn to the altar in tears. I couldn't resist. Nobody had to beg me. Nobody had to manipulate me to come to this altar to receive Christ because he drew me. Now, that's how Jesus comes to you and I. That's how he reveals himself to us. 
When you look at the history of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, I mean, the guy was an enemy to the Christian faith. He was out persecuting Christians, having them arrested, trying to clean the, the city. He had just cleaned the city of Jerusalem from, the, from these Christians. He's on his way to Damascus to continue the work of opposing the Christian faith. And what in the world happens? Jesus appears to him. And all of a sudden, Paul's heart is changed. Jesus says, no one can come to me unless... They are drawn to me by the Heavenly Father. He says that in John chapter 6, verse 44. The word drawn in that verse in John chapter 6, verse 44 is an inter interesting word. <laughs> Jesus says, no one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. The word drawn here means, it literally, it literally implies a fishing net. It describes someone who is fishing in the ancient days and they throw their net out. And, and, and as their net would be passing through the water, it would catch fish. And, 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 then, and then whoever was the fisherman, they would pull the net out of the water into the boat. And that's what it means to be drawn. It literally means you have been pulled and drawn towards something. Jesus says that's what God does. He draws us to, to Jesus. Maybe for years you thought you, you never thought about or had any interest in Jesus. You didn't believe in the resurrection. You thought it was just a bunch of Christian foolishness. You thought Christians were the kind of people you hear on TV or you watch on TV programs, judgmental hypocrites and bigoted. You think that's the way people who follow Jesus. But then all of a sudden you start to feel an interest stirring in your heart and mind. Jesus doesn't come to you, to the modern uh, unbeliever, and appear in bodily form, you say. But instead, what he does is he calls us, he invites us, and he draws us to himself. You feel it, you sense it, your mind and heart becomes captured. You can, may not can't explain it, all you know is Something is beginning to change in your life when it happens. Unbelievers, skeptics, the closed-minded sinners, they come to Jesus just like Thomas did, and they acknowledge him as Lord and Savior. Jesus told Thomas in John chapter 20, verse 29, he says, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Why are they blessed? Well, they're blessed because their sins have been forgiven. Every single one of our sins are forgiven when we come to Jesus. No matter how big, no matter how little, they're all, they're all forgiven. We're blessed because we feel at peace, not only with our maker, but with ourselves. We don't need to fear guilt or feel guilt. Our lives are changed. Some of us need to change on the inside and become different, and that's what happens. We know Jesus is real. We know he's alive. We have hope. No matter what life has for us, we have hope. And also, they're blessed because we have hope of an eternal life for all eternity. Just like Jesus did with his disciples and Thomas, Jesus will provide, to, he will provide you with what you need to believe. His presence will be revealed to you. You may be here today on Easter because that's what you do. <laughs> there are some folks that come to Easter services and they come to Christmas services. And I want to tell you, you're welcome. <laughs> you come when our door, whenever we have a worship service, you're welcome. We love having you. But if there is something stirring in your heart, and if there's something stirring in your mind, recognize what that is. It's the call of God drawing you to Christ, our Savior. And if you sense a need for something new in your life, if you sense a need for something different in your life, then just realize that that's Jesus knocking at your door. And the scripture says in Revelation 3.20 that behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone opens that door, I will come in and be with you 
I guess the only thing I can ask today is Christ knocking at your door. Do you feel that stirring? If, if it is, that is Jesus revealing himself to you. And it's real. And if you respond, I promise you, your life will never be the same. I can't intellectually convince you. You know, I remember I used to pray years ago, Lord, give me some kind of magical oratorical skills where I can persuade people to believe in Jesus. <laughs> I, used to, I used to really work at it. Then I discovered that I'm not the one that brings people to Jesus. That's, that's God's job, the work of the Holy Spirit. So if you sense Jesus' call in your life, don't deny it and don't ignore it. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that the resurrected Jesus who is alive today, this very moment, Lord, I pray that his spirit, the Holy Spirit, is speaking to people, especially those, Lord, who do not know Christ as their Savior. Lord, I pray that if you are knocking at their heart's door, Lord, that they will let you in and invite you to be part of their life, invite you to be their Savior. Let them know, Lord, it's real. It's not just some kind of emotional feeling. It's the real thing. So, Lord, open our hearts, open our eyes, open our minds so that we can see Jesus through faith. And we ask this now in our